morning and welcome to First Christian Church. Here are a few announcements that we'd like to share with you today. Tomorrow night, we will be hosting our biggest outreach of the year, Sweet Street. With the weather forecast looking good, we anticipate that we will have over 4,000 people in our back parking lot. Be sure to invite your friends, neighbors, and everyone you know to come join us from 5.30 to 7.30 for games, food, bouncy houses, and of course, candy. And it's all free. We look forward to seeing everyone there. Don't forget, this Wednesday we'll be having our weekly Bible studies called Family Ties. Dinner is at 6 with Bible studies immediately following. On the menu this week, breakfast for supper. Church League Basketball starts this Tuesday. If you're interested in playing, please sign up in the foyer today. Our packing party for Operation Christmas Child is next Sunday, November 6th. We would love to have you come join us at 1 p.m. We are still collecting bars of soap. We look forward to having everyone join us for this special event. Speaking of Christmas, it's time to get started on the children's Christmas play. If you would like to volunteer to help or if your child wants to participate, please see Rose Craig immediately after church today for more details. November 12th is a busy day here at FCC. We'll be hosting Crafty Saturday from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. The public is invited to come check out our bake sale and all the fun vendors who will be set up that day. Also, we'll be having the board meeting at 9 a.m. in the FCC offices. Everyone is invited. There are even more upcoming events listed in your bulletin. Don't forget, we keep our church website, Facebook page, and Twitter filled with the latest and greatest happenings here at First Christian Church. That's it for our announcements today. We hope you have a great week.
encourage you today to really focus in on your pursuit of God. As we pursue God within our lives, we need to make sure we pursue Him with the purest of reasons, with a godly perspective, and giving of our best. I want to first talk about pursuing God with pure intentions, pure reasons. We're going to take a look at Numbers. In Numbers, we come across a, a man named Korah, and he has a soldier followers, he's a priest. But he's not pursuing God with pure reasons. So let's take a look at uh, chapter 16, verses 1 and 3. Then we're going to skip to verses 8 through 10. It says this, Now Korah, son of Izar, son of Kor Korath, son of Levi, with Dathan and Abram, sons of Eliab, on the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took 2,250 2, promised Israelite men who were leaders of the community and re representatives in assembly, and they rebelled against Moses. They came together against Moses and Aaron and told them, You have gone too far. Everyone in the entire community is holy, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the Lord's assembly? And Moses also told Korah, Now listen, Levites, isn't it enough for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the Israelite community to bring you near to him, to perform the work of the Lord's tabernacle, and to stand before the community to minister to them? He has brought you near, and all your fellow Levites who are with you, but you are seeking the priesthood as well. Pursuing God. Uh, as we pursue God in our life, we need to make sure that we're pursuing God for the purest of reasons. Korah and his associates um, had seen a lot of advantages to the priesthood back when they lived in Egypt. Uh, the Egyptian priests were very wealthy, had tremendous political influence. And this is something that Korah wanted for himself. This wasn't something that he wanted for his community. This wasn't something that he thought would be cool. This is what he wanted for pure, self-centered reasons. Now, Korah may have assumed that Moses and Aaron and the sons were trying to make the Israelite priesthood the same kind of political machine he wanted to be a part of. It sounded like something he wanted to do. But he had a hard time understanding that Moses, the leader of that country, his main ambition was not to glorify himself. Moses' main ambition was not to be wealthy himself. But the fact that Moses' main ambition was to serve God rather than trying to control others. And Korah may appear to be holy. He may to appear to be the successful priest. But Moses saw right through the charge to the true motivation. Some of the Levites wanted the power of the priesthood. Like Korah, we often desire special qualities that God has given others. Korah had significant, worthwhile abilities. And he had incredible responsibilities on his own. He was a gifted man. He was blessed. He had talent. Uh, he was serving in a capacity of, of respect and among the people. He had everything to be successful, spiritually speaking. But the problem, that's not what he wanted. He wanted something he didn't have. He wouldn't settle for just being successful in God. He wanted to be successful by his means as well. In the end, his ambition would cost him everything. Inappropriate ambition is greed in disguise. I want to encourage you to make sure your ambition is pursuing God and to concentrate on finding God's purpose for you and your family. How do you find God's purpose? Well, there are several questions you need to ask yourself. You need to kind of give yourself a self-evaluation if you will. There are people that you need to reach out to. It's, it, it is God is encouraging you. He's giving you the opportunities to reach out to them. Now, when I say reach out, it don't mean exclusively evangelizing to someone who's never heard the gospel, although that is essentially a part of it. But 
But sometimes reaching out are those who need encouragement. You have friends and family members, people within our church, who could use a little bit of encouragement. Send them a card. Send them a text. Pay them a visit. Send them an email. Give them a Facebook message. Sometimes people just need encouragement. They're going through a tough time, and they just need an extra boost of encouragement, or they're going through a, a, a great time, but they still need the encouragement because it's a life-changing this, uh, this week, I had my sister's boyfriend was going to do something very major yesterday. So I talked to him Wednesday, and I, I just felt like I needed to reach out to him. And uh, he was very nervous, very nervous. I don't want to say he was uncertain, because that wouldn't be the case, but he was very nervous, very worried about every little thing. And finally, I just told him, you know what, just stop. Don't worry about this stuff. You're confident. You know what's going to happen. Just enjoy it. Enjoy every minute of this process. And yesterday, my sister uh, became engaged to this young man. Uh, we're very excited uh, for her and very excited for him and uh, very much looking forward to that. Um, but he needed that encouragement. He just needed that support. There's somebody you may need to reach out to, someone who you appreciate. We're very, very mad at appreciating people. We kind of look at that at times. But there are people that you need to reach out to to just appreciate them. Go out of your way to tell them thank you. To tell them why you are important. Why they are important to you. And just give them time of appreciation. We all love appreciation. There's a lot of people in our church that do a lot of things for the church and for others. And they don't necessarily need that appreciation to continue to do their work, they're going to continue to do their work, but you don't know, they may be having a tough day, and that those words of appreciation may mean the world to them. Um, there's people that you need to reach out to are people who need to learn. Teach them, guide them, be there for them. The things I mentioned, they don't take a whole lot of time. They don't cost any money. Just effort. Christ needs you. Christ needs you to reach out to people that you share your life with. Christ also needs you to reach out to his church. Uh, our church at First Christian, we need you. We need your support. We've got a lot of <coughs> ministries going on and a lot of things that we're trying to accomplish. Sweet Street tomorrow night is one of the big ones uh, in the near future. Um, and we need, we need people to encourage us. We need people to love on us, people to be our family. Uh, when we need something to, to, to support us in that capacity. And the other thing about church is the church needs financial support. Um, I'm not going to have a big old financial talk, so don't worry about it. But when I say the church needs financial support, most people, when you take a look at a Sunday, if you want to hear 52 sermons throughout the year on every Sunday, you probably don't want any one of them to be about tithing or giving money. But the only one, point that I have to make with that is, this is not a sermon specifically on that, but I do want to make a mention of it. The church needs financial support. In order for the church to continue to try to be successful, the church needs support financially. And in every bulletin, every Sunday, we give you the need and what came in. And we should always, as I do, and as my family and I do, take a look and see what we can give. And that's important. So the church needs your support. The church needs volunteers. Things don't just happen. You know, people need to be on board, helping, striving to make the difference that needs to be made. And uh, whether that's in vacation Bible school, a couple times during the year, or vacation Bible school or Sweet Streets, or whether it's an ongoing thing, people need uh, the church needs volunteer to accomplish and to help the church thrive. So ask, what can I do? Can I give a little bit more financially? Can I give a little bit more of the caring nature and appreciate and support people? Did, can I give a little bit of, uh, of, of my time? It's not really going to cost anything, but just some time and effort. Church also needs knowledge. Uh, there are people who are very, very, uh, have vast knowledge of various things. Uh, one of the people that I have the utmost respect for is Roger Williams, and he is. Uh, uh, obviously, as assistant superintendent of our school system, has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to education and has been such an asset to our preschool. There were various uh, behavior issues and academic issues that he has helped us with. 
Uh, these are information, this is knowledge I don't have, this is knowledge that we don't have readily available except through him. And he knows that, he realizes that, and he gives up his time and of his knowledge to make that kind of difference, which we so greatly appreciate. Uh, the church also needs experience. We have two trustees in our church that are constantly working around the clock, making repairs and, and doing what needs to happen. And, uh, I just respect them so much. I'm so amazed at what they know, what they know how to do. It is amazing what they can fix, what they can make and create. I get around telling people I wish I knew half of what they forgot because they just have so much knowledge and experience in that capacity. But then there are people who just have experience and you look up to them. You just look up to them because maybe you're going through that same time in your life. And you just need that person to give you the words of encouragement, give you the words of, of experience. Uh, church, our church needs you. Our, your family needs you. Our church needs you and our community needs you. Our community needs good people. This year, um, I decided in September that yeah, maybe this isn't the year I would be coaching. Uh, I've been coaching for seven, seven eight years on the fifth and sixth grade level. And I love the fifth and sixth grade level. Uh, they're old enough where they're more or less independent. independent. You don't have to worry about you know, following through their little thing with them. But at the same time, um, they're also fun. You know, they don't have this arrogant attitude yet that sometimes they can get in the older grades. I'm not going to mention specific grades because you might have a child in that grade. <coughs> but the funny thing is, I don't have to mention it because you're like, yep, that's here. Um, <laughs> so I, I appreciate that. And I just thought, you know, maybe this year with having Anderson and a few other things, that maybe this isn't the year for me. And uh, an individual called me. And uh, told me about the program. Well, when, I, when I started with that program, uh, we had about 11 or 12 kids that came out between the two grades, which, you know, we were pleased. And every year we'd get a little bit more, a little bit more. And this year we had 40 to sign up. And I said, that's great. I'm so glad that program's going well. And then he said, well, I need somebody to coach them. <laughs> so I told him, I said, I gotta talk to my wife. This is something that I said I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I gotta talk to my wife and I gotta talk to partner in crime, Shane Hockey, we, we have to see what we're going to do. We end up doing it. Um, maybe I need my head examined, but I had prayed the prayer that God use me in whatever capacity you shall see fit. And then when you pray that prayer, you've got to be ready with what doors he's going to open up, even if it's something you thought was already shut. Um, so we are, it's not all about us. Together we are stronger. Together we are more if we just work together. Speaking about being together, what I have on my ring, on my hand, finger, <coughs> is a wedding ring. Uh, several of us have it. What the wedding ring represents uh, in, the, in the service, in the wedding service, is something that I always love to share. Obviously, the, the ring is a circle, and it shows the eternal love that a couple has for one another. It's gold to represent the purest of its mothers. And I'll never forget when we got married and I put the ring on. One thing about me is I have never, ever worn a ring. Never, until this point. So when service, you know, you look wrongly to each other's eyes and all that, and Christy took the ring on my finger, it irritated me at first. I just wasn't used to it. I kept looking at it, I kept moving it up and down, because I couldn't get used to it. I couldn't get used to having something there. And then, you know, I walk off. I was always scared to death of walking off and getting it, walking off and leaving it somewhere that I couldn't find. I mean, just because I wasn't used to it. Uh, now I can't imagine uh, how doing without it. And uh, isn't that true a lot of times with, with the way marriage can be? When you first are married, there's a lot of challenges to go through. You have a lot of your first, uh, especially in that first year you have First big fight, first this, first that, first this, and, and it's, it's challenging. And some of it is just learning about each other and learning about each other's quirks and things like that. There are going to be things uh, that you didn't think you signed up for in marriage. <laughs> and uh, there are just things that you just don't know. But you know, as far as time has gone, if you think of the way you mean, the purity of its metals and the endless love. If a marriage has those two things, in this love, it's going to be a strong marriage. It's going to be one that, yeah, it's going to have its rocky times, it's going to have its tough times, but it will stand the test of time as 
long as the marriage has purity and endless love. And you put a limit on love and you dirty up and, 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 and hurt that trust, break that trust, then the marriage is going to suffer greatly. I'm not saying it's over, it's, it's, that's not the case. But it's going to suffer greatly. So how you can <clears throat> have a positive marriage, have a strong marriage, and how you can rebuild a marriage, <coughs> purity, and then you And purity and immense love exists. And it's a relationship that's going to stand the test of time. By the way, we should want that in our relationship with God. Endless love. It's not, instead, a lot of people get mad at God and they quit loving them. They don't have endless love. They have endless love. That they're just going to grow closer to God. And purity. Our lives have to be pure before God. As long as our lives are pure before God, and, and He'll forgive us of our sins, He'll take care of us, and I so much appreciate that. I think we all do. But we on our end have to make sure our relationship with God is pure, and our relationship with God is in His love. That can happen. But the way that happens is making sure that we have the right perspective. In number 16, 12 through 14, it says this. Moses went out and went for Dathan and Aram, the sons of Bela. But they said, we will not come. It is not enough that you brought us up from the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness. Do you also have to appoint yourself ruler over us? Furthermore, you did not bring us to the land flowing with milk and honey, or give us inheritance of fields or vineyards. Will you gouge out the eyes of these men? Will you not come? They had a horrible perspective. Again, first of all, they were thinking of Egypt as the land flowing with milk and honey. They forgot about the cruel slavery that they lived and the lives that they lived. They forgot all about that. But they struggled with that. On top of that, they were so focused on things that were irrelevant to the relationship with God. They didn't have the right perspective. And when you don't have the right perspective, it's easy to fall away. One well, of the easiest ways to fall away is following God is to look at our present problems and exaggerate them. David and Aram did just that when they began to long for better food and more pleasant surroundings. Egypt was beautiful. Egypt had all kinds of food. But they were overlooking the slavery and the bad treatment and the taskmasters, of course, because all they were focusing on was the beautiful Egypt and its wonderful food. You see, they wanted the best of both worlds. They wanted freedom, and they wanted the luxuries that Egypt had to offer. Now let's be honest, we can't fault them for that. How many of us like the best of both worlds? How many of us like to have our cake and eat it too? How many of us have that perspective that, hey, we can do both, we can have both, right? The problem was not fact that they wanted to vote. The problem was they weren't at all focused on God. They were not willing to pursue God for the right reasons. <laughs> so we have to make sure that we're keeping a godly perspective. It's a difference between being self-centered and selfless. There are two different kinds of people in the world. There are those who are self-centered and there are those who are selfless. Therefore, there are two different kinds of Christians, two different kinds of church members. Those who are self-centered are those who want success based on their own means. In other words, they have an idea for success, and that's what they want. And they will stop at nothing to get what they want. But then there are those who are selfless, who realize that when we became a Christian, we made a commitment to God on the day that we became a Christian to say that we will be faithful to Him, and that we will do all in our power to build up His kingdom. When you're living for God in His church, you're living a selfless life. But if you're living specifically for you and your idea of what you want, then you're living a self-centered life. And when you're living a self-centered life, it's easy to have a, a, a testing relationship with God. Another thing that overwhelmingly hinders our relationship with God is overrating problems. And those are that's just a phrase I'm going to use. It's actually defined. Uh, one word defines that. And that one word is drama. 
How many of us love drama? And how many of us don't want to have anything to do with drama? Quite frankly, myself, I think drama would be a waste of time. So if you're very passionate about drama, I do apologize if I offended you, but it's only because you're wrong. Um, <laughs> we cannot allow drama to be bigger than God. We cannot allow our problems and frustration to get in the way of us and God. We can't allow things to be bigger than God. When we allow things to be bigger than God, then we lose our focus. And that's when we lose sight of God. I want to encourage you to keep a godly perspective. Easier said than done. That's a simple thing. Keep your focus. But it's so hard. It's so easy to lose focus. We get busy. When we're so busy, we get tired. We get frustrated because things aren't going the way we thought. So then we start to lose focus. Sometimes life uh, is what causes us to lose focus. We get sick or we have a loved one who gets sick. And, and then we're focused on that. <coughs> uh, we, we hit a busy time in the year. And, and we lose sight of God. We're just trying to accomplish the busy schedule that we have. Uh, work becomes overwhelming. And that's when we have to figure out how can I have my family and, and work and God. And, and that becomes frustrating sometimes. Uh, extracurricular activities become overwhelming and become a focus. The reason why we lose focus with God is because we are people. It is oftentimes hard to focus on what we need because we're trying to take care of everybody else. We're so focused on taking care of everybody else. We're so focused on our responsibilities that sometimes it's easy to lose sight of God. When you lose sight of God is when you're hitting that road going downhill and it's, there's nothing to look forward to there. Focus on God. But as you focus on God, I have to warn you, Satan loves to pick on that. Satan's going to pick on the one thing that will crush you. He is going to use it to defeat what God is trying to do. And sadly, there are times that even change, change our thoughts toward God in all of our circumstances. Our focus on God has to be important because God wants to work through you. He's going to do something amazing if you stay focused and stay through the course. Don't let Satan win. God is the creator of this universe, creator of the world, and the creator of you. He's your loving father. He wants what's best for you. Don't let Satan ruin it. Stay the course. Remain faithful. Stay focused on God. What I want to encourage you to take a look at life as we continue to talk about the perspective that a godly perspective. As we take a look at tough times in life and bumps on the road, don't see them as defeats. But see them as challenges. I have uh, someone I'm very close to who uh, right now in their time of life is, is seeing a lot of defeats. And it breaks my heart because only she can see it. No one else can see it. But only she can see it. And every time there's a, she's had a lot of tough things happen in her life, and, and that has gone on, but now it's every little thing that happens becomes such a crushing defeat. And it just breaks my heart. You know, I'm sure you've had people in your family that have seen that same thing. And you're trying to show her, you're trying to make sure she understands that they're just challenges, they're just bumps along the road. But when every defeat's a crushing defeat, it's really hard to keep that focus. It's really hard to to help guide her to keep that focus. So if that has been you, don't let defeats destroy you. Don't let them be defeats. See them as mere challenges. That with the grace of God and His power working through you, that you can overcome. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to happen overnight. But there are challenges. They are not defeats. Satan will have you believe that they are defeats. They're not. They're just challenges. God, we will overcome. We have to have pure motives and keep our right perspective if we pursue God. And I'm here to tell you, it requires a commitment. It requires a commitment of 100%. And uh, there's a great point here with uh, Korah and all his associates. Moses got up and went to Dathan and Aram, and the elders of Israel followed, followed him. He warned the community, get away now from the tents of these wicked men. Don't touch anything that belongs to them, or you will be swept away because of all their sins. 
So they got away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan and Aram. Meanwhile, Dathan and Aram came out and stood at the entrance of their tents with their wives, children, and infants. Don't touch was the sign essentially they put out in front of the tent. The Israelites were told not even, to not even touch the belongings of these wicked rebels. In this case, doing so would show them sympathy and would show that you agree with their principles. Korah, Dathan, and Aram were directly challenging Moses and God's authority by making Moses the leader. Moses clearly stated what God intended to do to the rebels. Korah rebelled. When Korah rallied the Israelites in support of this rebellion, the Lord told of Moses and Aaron to distance themselves from the crowd because of this impending judgment. What was going to happen to Korah and his associates? The narrative stretches, stresses Moses' role as the mediator between God and the people of Israel. And Moses is pleading with God to give mercy to the congregation, to give mercy to those who are just being followers and just need to shift their focus. He's begging that of God. And he asks God only to punish the instigators. The Lord accepts. You see, Moses was not being self-centered. Moses was being selfless. He begged God for mercy, not for him, for his people. God gave them the choice, as he gives us a choice. They have a choice. They can follow God or they can follow Satan. Or in our perspective, they could follow Moses, who God was working through, or they could follow Korah, who Satan was working through. He gave them a choice. And in the end, those who chose God and chose to follow Moses would be spared. They had to show that they were committed to God. How are you showing your commitment? I'm going to encourage you to give 100% commitment to God. I didn't say 100% commitment to church. It's 100% commitment to God. When you give to God, give of your best. If you claim to be a follower of God, give 100%. What you have, give what you have. And give it with the best that you can be. Again, in coaching basketball, we always tell the kids, give 110%. We're not telling them to live and breathe. <coughs> we're just telling them in, when, we're, when we're at practice, when we're in the games, give all you have. So I'm going to ask you, this is a tough question to answer, but what kind of commitment are you giving God? Do you give them what's left after a crazy, busy week? Well, maybe you have a 10% commitment then. Do you make it a priority when life isn't so busy? Well, then maybe you're giving 25%. Do you make God a priority as long as it's in certain areas and certain times of your life? Okay, well, maybe you're giving him a third, 33%. Would you say that half the time God is a priority in your life and half the time uh, you're busy taking care of everything else? If that's you, maybe you're giving him 50%. Would you say that most of the time? You're thinking of God. Most of the time, you're, you're being a life worth following, just like the video that we saw. Not all the time, though, but most of the time. Maybe when you're at work, you don't. Know. Maybe when you're here, you don't. Know. Here or there, you don't. Know. And maybe you're 66 years old. But do you give God 100%? That's not giving God 100%. That's not giving church 100%. That's giving God 100%. When you're at work, you're there, you're a hard worker, and, and you're an example to everyone there. When you're at home, you're invested at home, you're, you're investing in your kids, your, your, your spouse, your grandkids, the list goes on and on, then you know, you're there, you're investing, you're showing them the love of Christ. Prayer time's important to you, study time's important to you, taking on the behavior of Christ is important to you, taking on his characteristics is important to you, then maybe that is being as close to 100% as you can. We may never get 100%, but that doesn't mean we can't strive for it. There's a lot of areas in life that you have to make good decisions. When Christy and I decided to have a baby, and the doctors gave us, finally gave us the okay, we knew that we were making a commitment. 
And it's not an 18 year commitment. It's an entire, it's a lifetime commitment. I can tell you my grandfather is 88 years old and he hasn't stopped marrying. My father is 60 years old, he hasn't stopped marrying. And sometimes I rebel a little bit more than I used to, but that's beside the point. Um, but the point being, they knew that they made a commitment. For Anderson, I know a little bit, and we have we were making a, we were making a commitment. As we're celebrating the new birth in our church today of Shane and Amy Harmon, and the, the birth of Avery, and their second daughter now, we're so excited for them, but we also know that they've made a commitment. As they did with David, the first daughter, and as they did now. And sometimes commitments are major like the babies, and Sometimes it's not as major, it's various things in life, like when you buy a new car, you're, make, you're putting in money, you're making an investment, uh, because you're hoping this car is going to be staying the test of time for a little while and be, have that kind of commitment. Maybe it's your job, you're trying to be committed because you know that as long as you stay there, there's room for success. Maybe it's a pet, you're agreeing again for life and that pet to take care of it. We make all kinds of commitments, and at one point in time in your life, you make a commitment to God. You made a commitment to God and a commitment to His church. How are you doing with it? What, per, what percentage are you committing to God? I encourage you, and I hope, and I pray for you, that you will be pursuing a relationship with God. And as you pursue that relationship with God, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. And make sure that you maintain purity in the relationship with God. Keep your focus on Him. Say so we'll do everything we can to get you all focused. As long as you stand the course of time, stay focused on God, the difference will be made. And be willing to make a commitment. As the musicians come forward, let me give you a quote. Someone once said, when we pray, we believe in all things God. Likewise, we should believe in our dreams while pursuing them. Are you focusing in on what God can do through you? Are you focusing in on what God has already done through you? The reality is we are blessed people. We are so incredibly blessed. God has given us so many things. And in return, He just asks us to have a pure relationship with Himself, with Him, and to pursue Him. To make sure we're maintaining that perspective. And understand that the day that we became a Christian, that we made a commitment. And the commitment we made was we would stay true to him, stay faithful to him, stay faithful to his team.